Welcome to the Lean Out Your Business podcast, a show dedicated to helping entrepreneurs accelerate business growth and simplify success. I'm your host, Krista Grasso, and I've been working with businesses for more than two decades to help them lean out and optimize what's working while eliminating anything that's not adding value. So if you are ready to get more time back in your day, more profit in your business, and to do business differently, growing and scaling on your terms, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. Today, I am so excited because Diane Winger is here with me, and her and I met at the She Podcast Conference, and instantly one of my most favorite humans on earth, an amazing business coach, and today I'm so excited for our conversation. Um, We're going to be talking all about standing out and beliefs and mindset shifts and what you really need to truly step into being different and help yourself be successful as an entrepreneur in business. So Diane, I'm so excited that you're here and I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about you and then we could chat a little bit about She Podcasts and then dive right in. Diane Winger is a no BS therapist turned business mindset coach for female solopreneurs. She is an expert on the intersection of mental health and entrepreneurship, and her jam is helping other women transform the beliefs and habits that hold them back from reaching their most important goals. Diane, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Oh my goodness. The last time we were together, we were sitting on this most amazing rainbow couch and acting super silly. (laughs) Wasn't that awesome? Oh, it was great. If you guys have not seen the pictures, head over to Instagram. It's at Krista Grasso. You will see fun pictures of Diane and I and Annie, who is one of our other uh, prior guests that's been on the show as well, having just far too much fun at that event. (laughs) But yeah, Diane, instantly just loved connecting with you. I love your entire approach to everything in your business. And I immediately knew that I wanted to have you on the podcast because I love what you stand for and what you talk about so much. And what I wanted to start with is I wanted to read a little part of the culture statement that you share on your website, because I think it's so incredibly powerful and so many people are going to resonate with it. So you can see the full statement on her site, but here's a little clip of it. She says, we live in a culture of conformity that attempts to instill fear of standing out, but we believe what makes you different makes you special. We are committed to lives of creativity, curiosity, and continuous personal evolution. I mean, I don't know that I could love that anymore if I tried. It's just so powerful and incredible. And so I thought, why don't we start our conversation there today. So, right, standing out, being different. We all know we need to do it. We all, I think, deep down want to do it. I think it really does help separate a business from other businesses, but there's a lot of mindset stuff that comes up and kind of gets in the way of that. And so what do you see? What are some of those challenges that keep people from wanting to stand out and embrace what makes them different? Such a great way to start and absolutely important because so many people start businesses, so many women start businesses, and they think they need to learn skills. But without the making the mindset changes and really embracing the fact that no matter what you're offering, you are in the business of sales and marketing, which means you have to become comfortable with saying, look at me, listen to me, pay attention to me. I have something to share that you might be interested in, which means that you have to overcome a lifetime of conditioning as a woman to sit down, shut up, blend in, and try to be liked. It is a much bigger challenge than most of us recognize. And, you know, we we both know a lot of people struggle with imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is basically nothing more than having an accurate opinion of yourself and thinking there's something wrong with it. And here's what I mean by this. You know, have you ever noticed that incompetent people never struggle with imposter syndrome? Inadequate people never struggle with imposter syndrome. People who are shamelessly self-promoting know-nothings never struggle with imposter syndrome. It is the 
best and the most brilliant among us that hold ourselves back because we think there's something wrong with saying, look over here, I've got something special for you, when in fact we do. Oh my God, so much brilliance in that statement. I've never even thought about it that way. But as you say that, I'm sure all of you listening have the same thing. Do you just have like certain people and accounts that are popping in your head right now? <laughs> yeah, and can we just say, for example, the term expert? Okay, expert used to mean someone who had all the possible education and training in years and years and years of experience. And even then, if you're a woman, you would very cautiously refer to yourself as an expert. In fact, most women wouldn't self-refer, but other people would say, she's an expert. Did you notice in my, in my intro, it says she is an expert in, because I have to practice too. Here's the thing. I, I'll tell you a little story because I think this really sort of encapsulates this. I am a bona fide expert, but I never thought of myself that way. And I certainly never led with that. Well, a few years ago, I went to an event and a young woman who had just barely finished her professional training was introducing herself as an expert. And I thought, did I hear that correctly? And then I, I wanted to meet her because I thought, that's so interesting. Like she's just barely started in this business. I've been in this business for 25 years. I don't consider myself an expert. So I asked her, you know, and she really didn't have anything to back it up, but was very comfortable and confident introducing herself as an expert. Well, I just sort of chalked it up as maybe this is an individual with some narcissistic tendencies, but I started really paying attention in the online space and realized there's a whole lot of this going on. So there's a little bit of a weird disconnect, Krista. And I think that this is where a lot of really bold, brilliant women who have a lot to offer sort of fall in. On the one hand, you see people who I refer to as shamelessly self-promoting know-nothings, people who are literally don't have anything to share. And this whole uh, culture that we're hearing about, you're an expert to the person who's three steps behind you. No, that's what we call the blind leading the blind, right? You can help someone if you've got a little tread on your tires and you've moved a little bit down the road, but if you are literally a brand new baby beginner, don't, don't try to help other brand new baby beginners. You're all going to be going around in circles with each other. But this is what's changed in culture in just the last few years. So now you've got all these legitimate experts, people who have so much knowledge, so much wisdom, so much experience, who are holding back and saying, that's so gross to promote myself like that, to say, look at me, listen to me. But guess who is doing so very comfortably and probably signing up your potential clients because you're not. This is what we're facing. It's very uncomfortable, but tell me if you agree or disagree. I do agree. And it's something that we talk about a lot. It's like the person who five minutes ago decided that they wanted to be a business coach has actual no experience building or running or scaling a business whatsoever. And they're out there offering these coaching packages that are like tens of thousands of dollars and making these really big, bold claims and positioning themselves in, as an expert. And meanwhile, there's those of us like me over here, like, uh, hello, built and scaled. Lots of businesses have been doing this for 30 years. Hello. Right. But because I'm not out there or I wasn't previously out there being like, hey, I'm an expert. Look at me. Look at everything I've done. It is. They're the ones who are signing the clients and we could be frustrated by it. We could feel all the feels about it. But at the end of the day, you know what they're doing? <laughs> they're stepping into what they believe their expertise is. They're positioning themselves to stand out and to be different. And they are getting clients. Will they get their clients great results for their clients? I really hope so. The reality is probably not. Um, but, you know, that's going to be part of their evolution. And when those clients don't get the results, they'll come hire us, which is what happens quite often. That's where a lot of my clients come from is they tried to work with one of these bright, shiny little coaches who came along and really, you know, made a lot of promises that they unfortunately just simply didn't have the experience yet to be able to deliver on. I think they believed fully in what they were selling and really wanted to be able to help somebody get those results, but they unfortunately just didn't have the expertise and experience 
to back it or to handle when things didn't go exactly according to their script. And so it, they come to us, right? <laughs> but there's no reason why we shouldn't be the ones out there as well, stepping into and claiming our expertise and what makes us unique and different, which in a lot of cases is those decades of experience. <laughs> Yes. And as a matter of fact, I, I actually commented on something online recently and a person and who happened to be a male said, your decades old education and experience are redundant and irrelevant. Shut up. And I was <laughs> like, so, so I think the other piece of it is, is that we see a lot of people who are very eager to promote themselves, but don't have a lot to back it up. And then we see people who are very reluctant to promote themselves, who can actually deliver on any number of promises. There's a real disconnect between the two. But I think one of the, the main reasons is, let's face it, we're afraid. We are afraid of being rejected. We are afraid of being criticized. And something I love to talk about, but I think it's, a, it's one of the most shameful things ever. I think women are afraid of two things in addition to that. We are afraid of other women being jealous of us and hashtag ambition shaming. I think we are also afraid of being perceived as ambitious. There's something about a woman who appears to others to have enough and still wants more that other people feel like she has to come down for that. Like that is somehow wrong. I think this is part of the patriarchy. I think this is how all women have been conditioned over many generations to know their place, not take up too much space, settle for what is offered, don't ask for more. And I think it's astonishing how many intelligent women I meet when you ask them, well, what do you want? They'll tell them, they'll tell me what they think they can get or what they think other people want from them or what other people ask for from them. Okay, that's all good and fine and maybe very helpful, but what do you want? It's amazing how many will just stop and say, I'm not sure I know because we're not actually encouraged by our culture to know what we want and to ask for what we want and to expect to receive it and to receive it, you know, with gratitude. Uh, I think all of these things are skills that most women don't have, no matter how well educated, no matter how successful this isn't, no, no matter how much money they make or how long they've been in business. It's, it's all of our cultural conditioning that makes it very difficult for women to ask because if you don't know what you want, how are you going to ask for it? And how are you going to know when it's enough? I think most women are settling in business for less than they want, less than they need, and less than they deserve. But it's almost like it's like a game that they don't, they haven't been given the rule book for. So how do you, how do you help people get past that? How do you help them A, realize that they're not actually tapping into what they want. They are just accepting kind of other people's, they're playing somebody else's game instead of their own. And so how do you help them realize that? And then what are some of those mindset shifts that you think are so important for them to be making? Well, going back to the culture statement about what makes you different, makes you special. I think it, it kind of stems from, from that. I think each of us has something special, something unique, to offer that if we were brave enough and believed enough that just being different is in an, in and of itself valuable, we could actually leverage that. And here's what I mean. Most people who are getting started in business, especially as coaches and consultants, they follow the leaders and everybody's trying to be another Amy Porterfield or another Brooke Castillo or another, you know, name some celebrity coach or, um, you know, high profile person. But what happens when they do that is that they will inevitably obscure everything that's unique and different and wonderful about them. The very things that will allow them to, instead of being a lesser version of Amy Porterfield, you could be a impeccably wonderful version of Krista Grasso or Diane Wingert. 
But we don't have the courage to do that because we're also growing up in a culture that teaches us that different is bad, different is defective, different is wrong, different is less than from the time that we are little kids. I mean, the most creative people, the the ones who often become entrepreneurs, those are the kids who have a hard time sitting still. Those are the kids who are doodling instead of listening. Those are the kids that are speaking out of turn and saying, hey, what about this? Um, We are conditioned by our culture from a very early age that being a good human is that you sit down, you be quiet, you follow the rules, you follow the leader, you don't ask too many questions. All of those things will suppress every entrepreneurial tendency that we have and all of our creativity in the process. So I think after years of doubting those things and frankly being told by parents, teachers, Sunday school leaders, soccer coaches, no, you're not doing it the right way. This is the way to do it. There is no right way, darling. There's no right way anymore. Your way may be completely different than anyone else's way. And that may be your secret sauce that will make you successful beyond your wildest imagination. But we have to come out from under this mindset of conforming to the norm and following the leader. That is not where creativity lives. That is not where innovation lives. That is not where people can change things for the better. You don't see Elon Musk doing that. <laughs> you don't see you don't see the people who are literally changing the world for the better looking to others for permission on what they should think or do. And that feels very scary and dangerous for most women. They used to put women to death as witches when they did things that made them stand out from the group. So I think there is you know there's the fear that we've personally grown up with, but I also think there's multi generations of fear that we have learned that's been passed down, that it's not safe to stand out. Because if you do, you'll get criticized, you'll get judged, or people will be jealous, or they'll think badly of you. Um, All of that is a lot to come out from under. It's not just, do I have imposter syndrome? It's, can I give myself permission to approve of who I am and how I am? Can I choose confidence instead of looking to other people and experiences to give me confidence as a reward for good behavior? It doesn't work that way. You have to choose it. Yeah, I love that. And it's so interesting because I think for me, my biggest fear in life is not being different like as being the same as somebody else. I was Mm. born with the different gene. Um, (laughs) Like I just, I strive to be different. Like for me, that's part of my identity is being different. But something that you said that I so deeply resonate with is for years I held myself back because I didn't want to make other people feel bad that they Mm. weren't getting the same results that I was or because I was standing out too much and other people weren't getting an opportunity to shine. And so I ended up going more that route of it where I would hold myself back or actually kind of dull my shine in a way because I didn't want other people to feel bad or I wanted other people to have an opportunity. And it took me like more than a decade (laughs) to get comfortable with. And sometimes I still struggle with kind of standing out and truly being different, not because I don't want to be different. That's just naturally who I am, but because I have this like deep seated, I don't want others to feel bad. Now, this is fascinating. Were you identified as gifted in childhood? I was. (laughs) Okay. So was I. And I think this is, um, I think it's a creative person problem. I think it's also a gifted person problem because um, I'm gifted, my daughter's gifted, and we have both had the experience that even when you're identified as as gifted, um, it's a gift. Like I say, it's a gift with purchase. It came with the package. I didn't earn it. Um, Maybe I've developed it over time, but it's it's just a part of me, like my eye color, my height. Um, And so I don't think it makes me better. I don't think it makes me superior. I do think it makes me different. I'm also neurodivergent in another way because I also have ADHD. So I definitely think differently. And what I learned in childhood is that even though, you know, I was identified gifted, I was in a gifted class, 
because learning was exciting and fun for me. And I challenged myself when the teacher was asking a question, if I could figure out what the question was about quickly, my hand would be up in the air because it was like a game show. Like I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to win the, I wanted to win the game. I was shamed for that because the teacher said, Diane, we know, you know, the answer. Why don't you give someone else a chance? And I thought, well, they can put their hand up too. So that was an important lesson for me that it's not, it's not good to be so eager to say, I know, I know that you are literally making other people feel bad if they don't. And I think that's, that's probably an experience that a lot of people have had. You have to be comfortable with the fact that you are different and maybe even quote unquote better in some cases, because if that's the truth and you pull back on that, you are not only not going to be happy and fulfilled yourself, but whatever your gifts are, they're not going to reach the people they are intended for. So everybody loses, but you're right. Being told you'll make other people feel bad. You know what? It took me longer than a decade. So you are still pretty quick on the draw. It took me a lot longer than a decade to realize I am not responsible for other people's feelings, including their feelings about me. Mm -hmm. Not responsible. But that feeling like, oh, if you figure something out quicker, or if you were able to create a website faster, or you were able to come up with names for products while other people struggle, that they might feel jealous. They might be envious. They might be uncomfortable with you. I, what are my choices? Like right. suppress or hopefully try to find other people who aren't intimidated and make them my friends. Yeah, I love this. And so for all of you listening, like I hope this is maybe taking you back to your childhood or some of those moments, because as you were telling your story about being in class, I can remember winning this amazing award, award at United Technologies Company back early in my career. And I was up for the same award again because all of my projects were performing better than others. And all of my peers who at first were happy for me became very not happy for me and were like, oh, like give someone else a chance to win already. And they got really kind of frustrated. And I'm like, um, be a better project manager. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, and so, but at the end of the day, like I remember these sorts of things. And I think that was when I really did start to kind of dumb it down a little bit. Like I just, I wouldn't be as vocal about things. I wouldn't talk about things as much. I wouldn't be the one to raise my hand, like you said, you know, as much because I'm like all these people who are my friends and my peers, they kind of are at the point that they just don't even want me participating because they know I'm going to win. And so if I don't enter or if I don't win, then it'll be a different experience. And it's like, I didn't recognize in the moment that was what happened. It took like 10 years of, you know, evolving and conditioning where I realized I was actually holding myself back because other people were frustrated I was winning. And so I stopped winning so other people wouldn't be frustrated. And yes. it's, just, it's so backwards when you think about it. And so again, your story triggered that story for me. I hope for all of you listening, you're recognizing if this is true for you as well, because I'm sure as we're saying this, you're like, of course, raise your hand. Of course, be the one to do it. Why would you hold yourself back? Well, turn that on yourself because I bet the exact same thing is true for you. And if you told us your story, we'd be right there saying, don't hold yourself back for that. Put yourself out there. Embrace what makes you different. Embrace your, your uniqueness, right? So, so true. In fact, one of the books that I recommend a lot and I use in my coaching work is The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, where they talk a lot about limiting beliefs and the upper limit issues and the zone of genius. And I think the, the four um, limiting beliefs that everyone has are that I'm fundamentally flawed, that basically if I allow myself to advance, I'm being disloyal to people from my past. The crime of outshining, which is if I allow myself to succeed to my full potential, I will surpass other people. And that's a bad thing. I'm like, it's a necessary thing. But until you can get through all of these mindset blocks, 
it is inevitable that no matter how high you are performing, how much money you're making, how big your business is, you have not reached your full potential because everyone has blind spots and everyone has beliefs, unconscious beliefs. They probably don't even know they have that limit them because way back in our ancient history, if you were separated from the group, you perish. So it is natural for humans to want to belong, to want to fit in, to want to be one of. And what we're saying is, no, what makes you different makes you special. Stand out, go all in on you. Evolutionarily, that feels like, but I'm going to die for sure. And you have to address that too, because that's, that's being human. Yeah, it is. And so one of the things I hear you talk about, and I'm curious how this fits into things is that you need to think like an entrepreneur. And so how does that kind of fit into this? And what does that mean to you? Well, I was, I had a corporate career and then I had a career in nonprofit in nonprofit and a career in academia. I'm in my fourth career now. So uh, I have been in each of these experiences. And what I realize is that as an entrepreneur, you take risks. You need to be resilient because some of the risks you take will work out. That's called success. And some of them won't work out. And that's what we call learning. So you need to keep trying new things. Otherwise, you don't learn and you don't grow. But Try, trying new things and taking risks is really not regarded or rewarded in corporate. In fact, I say what made you employee of the year is going to mess you up as an entrepreneur because we have to fail as entrepreneurs. I know it's a hard sell. I know it's a hard pill to swallow. I know nobody wants to hear it from me, but it's the absolute truth. How do you, why do you need to fail? Because you need to try things you've never tried before. And you need to keep doing that. Even if it's the same program, the same product, the same service that you've always sold, you need to keep looking for new ways to offer it, new ways to package it, new ways to deliver it, new ways to price it, new ways to make it more accessible. And some of them aren't going to work. In fact, some of them are going to be cringe worthy disasters. But you have to wrap your mind around the fact that that's a necessary part of the process because if we just keep doing what we're used to doing, we're going to keep getting the same results we already got, which I'm sorry, it's, this is, this is one of the things I say that people are least happy to hear. There are only two states in nature, growth and decay. If you are not growing, you are decaying. You have not plateaued. You are not taking a rest. You're decaying because business is moving ahead without you if you're staying where you are. That doesn't mean you always have to be getting bigger and doing new things, but keeping up with what's going on around you, things continue to change. So thinking like an entrepreneur is changing your relationship with fear and failure, most importantly. I have six different areas that I talk about, but this is the one I want to focus on right now with you. It's okay to be afraid. It's normal to be afraid. If you are afraid when you try new things for the first time, it's because you're human. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It doesn't mean you're making a mistake. It doesn't mean this is a, a circumstance that's going to fail. Fear is the inevitable result of trying something new because your brain is not your friend. Your brain doesn't want you to grow. Your brain doesn't want you to succeed. Your brain doesn't give two shits if you're fulfilled or not. Your brain just wants you to stay alive and staying alive means that you keep doing what you've always been doing because you're still alive. So it's obviously working. So your own brain will kick up a fuss when you do something new, but making the decision to change the way you feel about fear and using it as fuel and how you think about failure as a part of the process, a necessary part of the process that allows you to try new things and keep moving forward. That's totally doable. Doesn't sound very appealing to most people. I'm sure they would prefer, well, can't you tell me something that sounds like something I'd actually like to do? Well, I could. Maybe I'd be making a gazillion dollars if I did. But the reality is, as an experienced, self-employed human being like you, Krista, you have to be willing to try new things and you have to be willing to fail at them so you can learn. And if you make it less about you, 
in fact, it doesn't mean anything about you. It doesn't mean you're not cut out for this. It doesn't mean you suck. It doesn't mean, you know, you're destined to, you know, go nowhere. It just means this particular thing didn't work. So try something else or try it in a different way. It can even get to be fun. I think. I agree. And I always talk about the fact that I've had a lot of great successes in business and every last one of them came on the heels of a pretty epic failure that I learned so much from that that was how I was able to achieve that level of success. I don't think there's any successful person out there who did not have a lot of amazing learning opportunities that got them to the place that, you know, really generated the success that they have in their business. Everybody wants to skip that part, you know, and I think that's unfortunately where a lot of these newbie business coaches and consultants come from is six weeks or six months to six figures and, you know, have the laptop lifestyle and have, you know, location and time freedom and, you know, work from anywhere and work with the most dreamy clients and it's going to be super fun you can get to the point where it's less effortful. It's way more fun with clients that you really look forward to serving, but you're not going to start out that way. And it certainly isn't going to be six weeks or six months. That's exploiting people to tell them that because frankly, that's what they want to hear. It's just not true. Yeah. And if you are lucky enough to be one of those like unicorns that can pull it off, in the six weeks or the six months, the problem with it is that it's not sustainable. And if you've been in this industry as long as we have, and you kind of pay attention and you watch the people who pop up on the market with these six week to six figure programs, what you'll find is six months or a year or two years later, they're doing something completely different. They're not still selling that program. They're not even usually still working with the same people or selling the same thing. They keep reinventing themselves. And it's because their thing was a super short-lived, um, you know, quick win for them. And they tried to teach other people how to do it really quickly, realized people weren't getting the results and they move on and do something different. And so if you're around long enough, unfortunately, you realize that, uh, you know, as fun as it is, and as much as we all want that overnight success and that magic bullet and whatever you want to call it, it really does take experimentation, consistency, (laughs) being willing to fail, being willing to put yourself out there, being willing to learn. Um, And being willing to do all the stuff that Diane talked about and be unique and be different and embrace it and stand out. I love it. Diane, tell people more about you and where they can find you and tell them about your podcast. Hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, if I sound like somebody who knows a little bit about human nature and the brain, it's because I was a psychotherapist for over 25 years before I became a coach. And um, I... I think I I initially decided to make the difference because ultimately I wanted to change the conversation from problems to possibilities, but because I think while therapy is terrific for healing, trauma, abuse, dealing with addictions, loss, and things like that, at some point, it's not the tool of choice. Once you're healed and healthy and you want to grow and reach goals, I think coaching is much better suited to that. So I made that change myself. But I'm still keen that a lot of our limiting beliefs started in childhood. So the therapy background has been very helpful. I currently live in Portland, Oregon with my husband and two rescue chihuahuas. I have a Peloton that I love almost better than life. And if it wasn't for coffee, I don't think I'd be fit for human consumption. So uh, those are the highlights about me. Awesome. And where can people find you? Tell us where your uh, your website is, social, all the things. Oh, and you asked me about my podcast too. Sorry, mm-hmm. I didn't get that. My podcast is called The Driven Woman. There's a cool picture of me pre-COVID flexing. I don't quite look that way. I'm now I'm working my way back to it. But um, the Driven Woman podcast is for ambitious women falling short of their goals. So we have guest expert interviews. Krista is going to be coming up on one of them soon. I do client success stories and solo episodes where you just get all kinds of juicy goodness from me. I would love it if you'd follow me on Instagram at Coach Diane Wingert. You can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn, but I'm paying more attention to growing my Instagram following now. I love it. All right. And so the one question I ask everybody, and I cannot wait to hear what you have to say, is how do you work smarter, not harder, and keep things lean in your business? I Can I give you two? Of course. Okay. One is 
hire a virtual assistant before you think you're ready for one. I delayed that so long myself and literally within the first few weeks of hiring my first VA, I was sobbing because I realized how much easier my business could have been so much sooner if I hadn't been so stubbornly self-sufficient. Uh, virtual assistant can absolutely change your life. So hire one before you think you're ready. <clears throat> and the second one is I use little tools like this cube. I'm holding up a timer cube because in every business, there are tasks that must be done even by the CEO that after a while seem boring and tedious. And so we put them off and that strain on the business makes us a bottleneck. So what I do is I group them together in a batch and I set my little timer cube so that it's kind of like a game to see if I can finish them before the timer goes off. That way I'm not paying attention to how boring the task is, but trying to win before the timer goes off. And that's, I've been doing that for quite a while and it still works. I love it. That is such a great idea. And everybody who listens knows I am obsessed with focus blocks and batching. So I feel like I might need to take that and implement it in my next focus block. I love Yay. it. All right, Diane, this has been amazing. I feel like we could literally talk for days. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to being on your podcast as well. So everyone check the show notes, the links to um, all everything that Diane shared will be in there, including the link to her podcast where you can find my interview. So check that out. And Diane, any final um, thoughts for people? Anything you want to leave people with when it comes to kind of transforming their beliefs and their mindset and really standing out? I would say the first and foremost is don't expect anyone to give you permission to change your opinion of yourself. Most people look to others for approval, for acceptance, for permission, and they think that they need that to think more highly of themselves, to literally evolve their opinion of themselves so they feel more comfortable with promotion and being their lovely self. It's an inside job. You need to give yourself that permission. I know that feels really scary and really dangerous, but trust me, it's, uh, it's totally worth it. And nobody, nobody is going to give you the permission that you need. You give you the permission and then keep going. All right, Diane, thank you so much. This was an amazing interview, everyone. I hope you got so much value out of today's episode. We will see you again next week. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. I hope you got a lot of value and actionable insights from today's show and would love if you take a moment to leave us a review. If you have any questions on today's episode or on how to lean out your business, join us over in our private Facebook community where every week we do live training and Q&A and I'd love to have you be part of the conversation. Head to leanoutmethod.com slash group to join us. And before you go, be sure to subscribe to the show so you're the first to know when we release a new episode. We'll see you next week.